This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. Couple of big games coming up the next two nights in the NBA and the Stanley Cup Finals. We're going to break down both those games. Game three between the Golden Knights and the Panthers and game four between the Nuggets and the Heat today with Tom Vecchio picking his brain on the markets for those games and getting you ready for those. Then I'll talk some NASCAR at Sonoma later on today. Welcome on into covering the spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire, Joined here, as mentioned, by Tom Vecchio. Check him out on Twitter at DFS underscore Tom. Find his work over at numberfire.com. And Tom, last night, game number three, the Nuggets kind of looked like what they did in game one, what they looked like for part of game two as well. Are we starting to think that that second half of the Heat in game two was odd? Because it seems a bit odd based on the way things have gone outside of that so far. Yeah, certainly a, a great performance from the Nuggets. I would say arguably their best game of the entire playoffs. The Heat have you know been a really good fourth quarter team, not only through the playoffs, but really throughout the entire year. And it could just be, you know, they, they, the Nuggets thought they had some momentum in the first half of, of game two, and then that kind of slipped a little bit. You know, you, you give an inch and a team takes a mile kind of thing. So it could just be uh, a bit of flukiness, and the Heat stole that quarter. Thus, they stole the game. Uh, but the Nuggets are are looking dominant right now. They are looking real good. And I think the problem is Jamal Murray may have had like the quietest 30 point triple double in the history of society last night because you have Murray 12 to one for MVP for the series. And yeah. it kind of sucks for that future, Tom, when he goes 34, 10 and 10 and nobody's talking about it the next day because Nikola Jokic did 30, 20 and 10. Uh, yeah, you know, th- I, that was that was part of my like assumption, like, okay, you know, I spoke about like, what if the heat sell out to try and like fully eliminate Jokic? I still said like, Jokic is going to get his. I just thought that presented an opportunity for Murray and he's obviously taking advantage of that, but like he already had like such a differential to make up that it, like, I think process wise it was good, but in like reality, we know what's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, 12 to one, the odds that hitting are eight, 0.5% tried to do math. I might be off on that. That might be 11. Anyway, it's like it's below 10%. So that's accounted for in the odds. Um, I think it's still got a chance. Maybe you never know. Um, Given the way it's performed, it's not totally out of the question, but I think you might need a longer series to kind of keep things a bit more competitive there. We're going to talk about game four between Nuggets and Heat later on. We'll also talk uh, game three coming up tonight between the Golden Knights and the Panthers in just one second. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast because tomorrow, a couple of shows coming your way. Uh, two shows for Friday, one on the Belmont Stakes talking to Christina Blacker of FanDuel TV once again. Had her on uh, for the Preakness and she called National Treasure to win. So I'm going to talk to her once again about, about the about the Belmont, and then also tomorrow, Rob Friedman, Pitching Ninja, back in the show, talks some strikeout props. FanDuel is putting out these markets where you can bet on who will lead the night in strikeouts. So we'll talk to Rob about his uh, favorite bets for that fun market for me with my NASCAR golf brain. I love that market, so we'll talk to Rob about that tomorrow. Get that by subscribing to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts, and also check us out over on the FanDuel YouTube page. Let's talk now about game number three, Tom, between the Golden Knights and the Panthers coming up tonight. And as of right now, over at FanDuel Sportsbook, Panthers are the favorites by a tiny bit. The money line is minus 118. The Knights money line is minus 102. Total this game is five and a half with minus 140 on the over as of right now. And this series is skewed heavily towards Vegas and towards it being a high scoring uh, series thus far. So Are you looking to bet against those trends as the series now moves to Florida, or are you thinking more of the same? Uh, I'm expecting much of the same. At this point, it's tough for me to bet either of those just based on the prior bets that I have, which would be going against them. So, uh, you know, to recap, when I was here last week before the series started, I talked about under 33 and a half total goals for the series, and that you know, that's a bet that I have. And there's been 16 goals through two games. So at this point, I would want a Vegas Golden Knights sweep. 
yeah. because that would ensure that. And it also, I think, plays into the Jonathan Marshall show bet that I have for leading the series in total goals at plus 750. So if I were to bet on the over, which is the way things have been skewing, that's obviously fully against what I am wanting from the total goals. And then if I bet on the Panthers, that would, in theory, extend the series, and that's also against total goals. So I, I have to not make a pick on that. I think it leads me to player props. But I will say from a process standpoint, a lot of it would lead me to the Panthers. Now, just to dig into some like really nitty-gritty details, through two games, the Panthers have scored – three goals in 5v5 situations, despite having 4.6 expected goals scored. Through two games, the Vegas Golden Knights have scored eight goals in 5v5 situations, despite having 3.9 expected huh. goals. That's just in 5v5. Now, if we look at the series overall, Panthers have scored four goals on 7.02 expected goals, and the Golden Knights have scored 12 goals on 7.18 expected goals. Huh. All situations, the series is 7.18 to 7.02 in expected goals. That's literally a coin flip, despite the fact that it looks like Vegas is dominating. So from a process standpoint, and not to mention the fact that the Panthers are controlling the core C4 percentage in both all situations and 5v5 situations. So from a process standpoint, everything would lead me to saying the Panthers aren't scoring enough. They're vastly underperforming. The Vegas Golden Knights are vastly overperforming, and they shouldn't be scoring this much. They shouldn't be you know, scoring at such a low rate, all these sorts of things. So it, it would lead me to the Panthers if I were to make a recommendation. Very long explanation if I had to make a pick for the money line. But it sounds like you're not swayed enough to actually pull the trigger there. Is that correct? Yes. Part of that is we're obviously dealing with, with a, it's a two game sample size. Like the variance is massive at this point. And right. I've talked about it before where I think Bob Rowski is 100% better goalie compared to Aiden Hill, but I've also talked about time and time again that the system that Bruce Cassidy has as the head coach for Vegas protects Aiden Hill so much that he's able to stop a lot of these shots because they're not always high-quality shots for the right. opponent. They're they're pushed to the outside. So a two-game sample size, I would want to flip to the other side just because I'm saying, okay, it's going to be lower scoring. Panthers are going to win, but – I can't necessarily take that with the other bets that I have locked in. Right. And like, let's say hypothetically, you don't have the under 33 and a half goals. Don't right. have the Marsha show to lead the series. Would that be enough for you to buy in the Panthers yes. at minus 118? Okay. It would. And okay. I, I think the, the money lines are, are where they should be. Yeah. You know, if the series was tied one, one, it might be a little bit more in favor of the Panthers minus 130 ish. Probably wouldn't be much more than that. Yeah. Um, but I think the money lines are fine. I would lean towards the Panthers you know, regardless of anything else. So you're on the Panthers at minus 118. Let's talk now about player props. When you look at those over at FanDuel Sportsbook, Tom, what stands out to be you as being a good value for tonight? Love Brandon Montour over two and a half shots at plus 134. He is the top defender for the Florida Panthers. He leads the entire series in ice time of any player on any team. Uh oh, it's shifted, Tom. Oh, it's what is three it? and a half now? Ooh. <laughs> What are we doing here? Um, so I three and a half. He has eight shots through two games. It's plus one thirty four over three and a half. Um, if we look at to record two plus shots, because I can also go to the the yeah, that the there old market minus. Six. Oh no, sorry, that's two plus shots, dummy, Jim. Okay, uh, Montour minus two ten to get three plus shots. That too um, steep for you? That's really borderline. I will if yeah. that was if. You know, if that was 180, minus 180, I would have a little more interest. Yeah. I guess I'll pivot to uh, Alexander Barkov at over two and a half, minus 130. I think okay. that is a spot that I'll be looking to go. He's on their top forward line, top center. I've talked about it before. Home team does have that second line change, so it can put him in more favorable spots because they can, you know, if the fourth line goes out there for Vegas, they can match with the first line. Despite the fact that Vegas is very deep down the center and they are great at faceoffs, Barkov is theoretically in a, in a better spot. So minus 130 for over two and a half shots for Sasha Barkov is the spot that I would go. Okay, let's talk quickly about um, uh, about Montour because hypothetically there might still be books out there where it's still a two and a half. What puts right. you on Montour over two and a half initially, and where is like the cutoff point for you where it's no longer a value? So, again, he leads the team in ice time uh, of any player in the series. He's 
you know, top defender on Florida. He leads all players in the series in terms of Corsi four percentage, which means when he is on the ice, he is, we're seeing Florida, not necessarily hundred percent because of him, but Florida dominates possession. They're dominating the shot attempt. So he is an offensive driven defensive player and, you know, add in the desperation factor where they have to get shots to the net. Like it's his role to kind of generate and start the offense when he's playing on the blue line, D to D, those sorts of things. So when he's on the ice, Florida generates shots, period, end of story. So because his ice time is so high, it generally puts him in a good spot to see a high volume of shots, regardless of the quality, then we don't necessarily care about that. Right. So the cutoff would be if you can find two and a half out there, I would go, like I said, to, to minus 175, minus 180. I think that sure. does actually present value. Eight shots through two games is very solid. Okay. So if you can find minus 175, minus 180 on Montour over three, two and a half shots, uh, that would be as far as Tom would go. Otherwise, liking uh, Sasha Barkov over two and a half shots, minus right. 130 with where things currently stand over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Let's talk now about the NBA and talk about game number four here between the Nuggets and the Heat. Of course, the Nuggets taking game number three last night and now holding a two to one lead in the series. Heading into game number three, spread here was two and a half in favor of the Nuggets. It is now three and a half coming off what we saw last night with the decently dominant win for the Nuggets, the total down to two ten and a half. So, Tom, let's start things off here with the traditional markets. Spread more hate more heavily now in Denver's favor. Any traditional market bets stand out to you as of right now for game four? As of right now, the only spot that I would look would be the under in terms of these markets. And the defense that we saw from Denver is really their peak. And like I said at the top, like this, that last night could have been their their best game of the entire playoffs where everyone gets involved. They you know have great involvement from Jokic and Murray. They're great on defense. Now, granted, did Miami miss some shots here and there? Yeah. Is there natural variance to them missing you know, some layups? Yes. But granted, Denver took advantage of that and they out rebounded them by 25. I think the margin was so Denver did everything right that they had to do. So I would once again lean towards the under. And maybe this is the spot where like Miami's juice has run out. Everyone's talked about how they've been overperforming in terms of you know field goal percentage and three point percentage and effective field goal percentage and all these sorts of things. Like maybe the juice has run out at this point because they played so many games and Mm-hmm. Is it again? I've talked about like, is it sustainable for that eight game stretch through a few series? Yeah, but maybe this is the breaking point for them. So now they have a breaking point against what we know is a great defense. It leans, it you know, just leads to no scoring for anyone. Right. I feel like I never want to doubt Jimmy Butler. I feel like the narrative will crop up after last night that even though he, he did well, that, oh, maybe he's tired. Maybe the ankle thing from the Knicks series could be him or could be, you know, biting him. I personally have seen enough from Jimmy Butler where I don't want to buy into that. So what are your thoughts on him specifically? Are you worried at all? Or are we still, you know, treating him as if it's playoff Jimmy Butler who we saw the previous couple series? I think you can always treat it as, uh, you know, it is playoff Jimmy. And I think the best way to take advantage of that is probably the PRA bet where he's going to be involved Will we see a massive amount of scoring from him? Maybe not, but he can do so much when it comes to rebounding and assists that you can kind of be in on that. That's, uh, I I guess, a way to have exposure to the heat in some capacity if you don't want to take their money line. And again, I think it does have some correlation with the under. Uh, And they got out-rebounded, like I said, by 25. So if they have this team effort that everyone needs to rebound, then Jimmy will be in there doing more and more. Okay. So we're liking the under at 210 and a half. That is uh, currently minus one way to FanDuel Sportsbook. What about player props, Tom? What stands out to you there? So there are two that I've interest in, and they obviously are directly tied to the Heat. Uh, excuse me, not to the Heat, to the Nuggets winning. And it's actually under player performance doubles. Okay. So it should be on that popular page. Uh, you know, scroll a little bit down. Jokic double double and Nuggets win is minus 132. Jokic triple double and Nuggets win is plus 170. I think those are really good when we look at these numbers compared to the Nuggets money line. Yeah. And you'd have to say, and and I think the, the purest example of this is what we saw from game two. And then I talked about this on Monday morning, it was on Sports Grid with Ben Stevens. Jokic in game two only had four assists. Despite him dropping 40 points, he had four assists and they lost that game. And what I said was, you know, Jokic is at his best when he's distributing the ball. Therefore, the Nuggets as a team are at their best because everyone's getting involved. And it doesn't matter that he had 40 points. 
last night he had a triple double and they win the game because everyone's getting, you know, the, the, the offense is more spread out. So I think this correlates in, in a nice way with Jokic performing well, which we know he's going to do nuggets winning, which we know they're clearly capable of and the value and the odds are just so much better on these performance bonuses compared to the money line. And I think that the way that the double double one is being treated is as if the double double is a certainty. Effectively, yeah. uh, that's minus one thirty two money line minus one fifty two. So not a lot of edge there. So it sounds like based on the way you're talking, is if you prefer the triple double one. So Jokic should get a triple double, Nuggets to win at plus one seventy. Is that correct? Right. I, I love that one. And you know he doesn't have to have again. He doesn't have to have forty points. He doesn't have to have twenty one rebounds like he did last night. It can be his normal triple double, which I think falls in line with the potential game script where he's still going to get his shots up. He's going to have plenty of rebounds and they have to make it a point where everyone gets involved with him passing the ball because having four assists is clearly not the path to them winning, which we saw in game two. It's everyone getting involved, knocking down some shots. So I think we we tie this all together and plus 170, I don't want to say essentially for Denver to win, but pretty close is something that I love. All righty. So we're checking out Nikola Jokic to have a triple double and the Nuggets to win at plus 170, uh, potentially on the under as well at 210, uh, 210 and a half at minus 108 on the under over at FanDuel Sportsbook. That is Tom Vecchio. Make sure you check him out on Twitter at DFS underscore Tom. Find his work over at Number Fire as well. Tom, it has been a delight as always. Enjoy game three tonight between the Golden Knights and the Panthers. Good luck sweating uh, the bets that you've got out there and uh, good luck uh, with the NBA Finals on Friday as well. We'll talk to you yeah. soon. Thanks for having me. All righty. Again, check out Tom on Twitter at DFS underscore Tom. You can find his work over at Number Fire as well. We'll dive into some NASCAR for this weekend in Sonoma in just one second. But first, we're about to crown a new NBA champion. And FanDuel wants you to be a part of the excitement. Because right now, new customers can get a no-sweat first bet up to $2,500. That is $2,500 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. There's no better place to bet all the finals action than America's number one sportsbook, FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. Must be 21 plus and present in select states. First online real money wager only. $10 deposit required. Refund issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See full terms at FanDuel.com slash sportsbook. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino, LLC. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG in Arizona. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342. In Connecticut, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. In Wyoming and Kansas, 1-800-522-4700. We're in Kansas, ksgamblinghealth.com. Louisiana is 1-877-770-STOP. In Massachusetts, gamblinghelplinema.org. Or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support. In Maryland, mdgamblinghealth.org. In New York, 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text hope and y And in West Virginia, go to 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Now let's talk here about some NASCAR because NASCAR heading out to Sonoma for this weekend. It is their second road course race of this year. The first one of the circuit of the Americas that one Tyler Reddick won and was pretty dominant, but circuit of the Americas and Coda do have some key differences and Reddick is the favorite right now at plus four fifty over at FanDuel Sportsbook. And I do have his win outs pretty high. I've got Kyle Larson and Chase Elliott a bit above him though, because of the struggles Toyota has had on road courses and Reddick isn't a Toyota. So I'm okay being higher on them. The problem is I can't quite get to Larson at uh, plus 470 or Elliot at plus 500. If Elliot were six to one, I probably would bite, but haven't seen that as of yet. If we look at just the odds over at FanDuel Sportsbook, there are a couple outrights that do stand out to me as of right now before practicing qualifying. The first one being Daniel Suarez at 16 to one. I've got Suarez at 6.9% to win this race versus the implied odds at 5.9%. And the reason Suarez is high should be pretty obvious in that he won this race last year, his lone win in the NASCAR Cup Series so far, but he won it in pretty dominant fashion. And honestly, that wasn't a surprise because at Coda last year, he won the first stage, ran really well in that opening stage, then got caught up in a spin, never really rebounded from that. But you kind of saw the strength in that race for Suarez. This year at Coda, he ran pretty well also. Seventh place, average running position for Suarez at Coda. 
He's coming off a solid run at Gateway last week, and I actually do have that inside my model because at Gateway, very flat track with a lot of shifting, and that can correlate to Sonoma despite the fact they're uh, it's a different rules package they used last week versus the one they'll use this week. So I get access to last year's winner of this race. He's in a Chevy, which is always, I think, a good thing for this week. He's 16 to 1 to win. I've got value there. I think he'll probably shorten post practice and qualifying. So I want to take Suarez right now, 16 to 1, to win at Sonoma as the first outright of this week. The second outright is also on a guy where I want to take a top 10 bet on him. So this will be a scaling bet and a bet where I put some on uh, the outright, but then more on the top 10 bet in order to ensure a profit should this driver finish top 10, which I think the odds are pretty good of doing. That is Michael McDowell. He is 40 to 1 to win and plus 155 for a top 10 at FanDuel Sportsbook. And I am a lot higher on McDowell than the market right now, potentially in a way where I am too high. But I also think that 40 to 1 is kind of absurd. He has not shown a lot of upside throughout his career outside of a win at Daytona. But he did finish third here last year, ran really well. He had a top 10 average running position in all but one road course race last year. The one exception for him last year across all the road courses was at Circuit of the Americas. So the fact that he didn't light it up at Coda this year to me is not a huge concern. And he wasn't awful in that race, was in contention for a top 10 pretty late. So not a big red flag to me that he didn't run great there. The implied odds for McDowell to win are uh, 2.4% at 40 to 1. So even if I'm too high on him, I think the market is too low. So I'll take the outright. As of the top 10, at uh, plus 155, McDowell's implied odds are under 40%. And I find that pretty enticing because my model has him at 47% to finish inside the top 10. He has finished top 10 in four out of seven road course races in the next gen car which is a 57% rate. Small sample as always, but again, the implied odds, 39%. That gap is pretty, pretty big. McDowell is a great road racer, and he showed that back in the day before the next-gen car, but now at the next-gen car, the equipment gap between Hendrick Motorsports and Front Row, Front Row, which is where McDowell races, is not as large. So he's been better able to show his talent on these road courses recently. So again, what I would do here is scale this bet where... If McDowell finishes top 10, you profit, but then you have some upside via the outright as well for him to win at 40 to 1. So, outrights for this week, I like Suarez 16 to 1, McDowell 40 to 1. Couple guys who finished in the podium here last year, two very good road racers who have had good enough form this year and also did run pretty well in Gateway last week. I think that makes a lot of sense. The other top 10s where I'm showing value are on Austin Dillon at plus 650 and Zane Smith at 8 to 1. Let's start here with Austin Dillon. Uh, He is, uh, the implied odds of plus 650 are 13.3%, whereas I have Dillon at 20.3%. And Dillon had this long stretch to open his career where he had zero top tens and road courses for, I think it was like 19 consecutive races. But in the next gen era, which is a seven start sample, he already has two top tens and road courses. And he finished 11th here last year. So not a top 10, but just outside it and showing that he sticks around, doesn't make a lot of mistakes. He's worked a lot on his road racing the past couple of years, and it's definitely paid dividends. So 20.3% for me, 13.3% implied. I think Dylan is a good bet at plus 650 to finish inside the top 10. I've also got value on Zane Smith at uh, 8 to 1. Not as much value, and I also would shop around because I got Zane Smith uh, 12 to 1 yesterday elsewhere. So shop around, see what number you can get on Zane Smith. 8 to 1 is long enough for me to bite. Much prefer it longer if you can get there because the edge is smaller here. I've got Zane Smith 14.3% to finish top 10, implied odds 8 to 1 or 11.1%. So as always, shop around, see what you can get. But there is a big enough gap where I would take it if 8 to 1 is the best number you can get. The reason I'm high on Zane Smith is that he is McDowell's teammate this weekend running in that front row car. Uh, Todd Gillen going over to the Rick Ware racing car for this week once again. And... We've seen McDowell demonstrate this car can push for wins, not just top 10, but wins in this car. So that's a good thing. But also, it's not just McDowell. Todd Gilliland has a couple top 10s on road courses uh, since he started the Cup Series as well. So we've seen this team push for top 10s with two separate drivers, and they seem to view Zane Smith better than they view Todd Gilliland. So the fact that Gilliland has done that, I think, is pretty encouraging. Smith in the truck series has run four road course races since the beginning of last year. 
His finishes, they are first, second, second, and first. And obviously, level of competition is much different down there than it is up here in the in the Cup Series. But you go back to Circuit of the Americas this year, and he was racing against Ross Chastain, Kyle Busch, pretty tough field, and Zane Smith uh, ran well in that one. So again, Zane Smith, I'm at 14.3% top 10, implied odds are 11.1%. I think there is a decent shot that he reopens longer than eight to one, depending on how things, how qualifying goes. But I kind of wanted to take it now again. I have a 12 to one, but eight to one. I think I would want to lock that into. So the bets I like this week for Sonoma are Daniel Suarez to win 16 to one, Michael McDowell to win 40 to one McDowell top 10 at plus 155, Austin Dillon top 10 at plus 650, and Zane Smith top 10 at eight to one road courses have been up and down for sure but I feel pretty good about this. And I think the market is a bit off on all those guys. So very okay. Locking those bets in before practice and qualifying coming up on Saturday. That is all that we have here for today on covering the spread. As mentioned though, double show tomorrow, talking some strikeout props with pitching ninja and then talking the Belmont stakes with Christina Blacker, get all those by subscribing to the number, the covering the spread podcast feed, wherever you get your podcast. If you like what you hear, leave us a five-star rating on Apple or on Spotify, or give us a thumbs up over on the FanDuel YouTube page. Big thank you once again to Tom Vecchio. Check him out on Twitter at DFS underscore Tom. Find his work over at numberfire.com. If you got any questions for me, I'm on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. Want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets for game three between Vegas and Florida. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow for what should be a fun day here on the show. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 